Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga series, the book that changed my life. This is fourth episode and we are now starting the second chapter. This chapter is titled The Three Steps of Nature. Here we can see that Sri Aurobindo is continuing that theme of nature. Here are the three steps of nature. What are these three steps? Let's explore. Let me read. We recognize then in the past developments of yoga, a specializing and separative tendency, a specializing and separative tendency. Remember, in the first chapter, Life and Yoga, Sri Aurobindo gave us insights into the two necessities of nature. One is that evolutionary process, things moving from simple forms to more and more complex forms evolving from simple to complex. In that journey, there is a tendency towards diversity, a specializing diversification into many branches. And then these diversified tendencies coming together into a great synthesis of a higher level of complexity, totality and oneness. So that is what he is bringing in here. In the past developments of yoga, a specializing and separative tendency, which, like all things in nature, had its justifying and even imperative utility. So this diversification into specialized branches of yoga had its utility. It has its justification. On one hand, there is this nature's own process of yoga that is specializing into multiple branches, at the same time moving towards higher and higher levels of complexity, that evolutionary imperative. There is an imperative utility. In the course of evolution, it is inevitable that everything moves from simple to complex harmony. And we seek a synthesis of the specialized aims and methods which have, in consequence, come into being. So we are at this juncture of the history of yoga where we are looking at how do we synthesize these separative tendencies, specialized efforts, if we are to bring them together, how do we do that? If we are to synthesize the specialized aims and methods, because each yogic school has its own aim, its own method. There's a difference in aim, there's a difference in method. As he has touched upon in the last chapter, each school of yoga picking up one or other psychological faculty and intensifying and accelerating the course of our evolution. So let me read again this line. We recognize then in the past developments of yoga, a specializing and separative tendency, which like all things in nature, so this is just like all things in nature. It's part of that nature's vast yoga. That is a very, very important point that he brought in. Yoga is not our human effort. It is part of nature's vast subconscious yoga, which is becoming conscious in human beings. Like all things in nature had its justifying and even imperative utility and we seek a synthesis of the specialized aims and methods 
which have in consequence come into being. So we need to find that synthesis. But in order that we may be wisely guided in our effort, wisely guided in our effort, we must know first the general principle and purpose, general principle and purpose underlying this separative impulse. For each separative impulse, there is an underlying principle and a purpose. We need to discover that. So when we look at various schools of yoga, we need to look into that underlying principle and its purpose. The general principle and purpose underlying the separative impulse and next, the particular utilities upon which the method of each school of yoga is founded. What is the particular utility upon which the method of each school of yoga is founded? Utility. Every school of yoga, when it chooses a particular psychological faculty, along with it comes its specialized utility of it. Hatha yogins using the body as a means, as a bridge to connect with the free, connect with the spirit, they bring its corresponding utility of the longevity of the body, the resilience of the body, health of the body, fitness of the body. Whereas Bhakti Yoga, which is more intuitive, which utilizes the heart and its emotions, expands the heart, the richness of emotional experience, the intensity of the connection with the divine, the experience of ananda that comes with it. So each school has its specific method and corresponding utility. So we must know first the general principle and purpose underlying this separative impulse and next the particular utilities upon which the method of each school of yoga is founded. So each method is founded upon a specific utility, particular utility upon which the method of each school of yoga is founded. For the general principle, we must interrogate the universal workings of nature herself. Chirabindo is referring to nature as she. We may consider this as poetic imagery. No, it is not. Yoga is subjective science and nature is referred to as she because nature is conscious force and there is a conscious relationship with nature. And gender-wise, in general, nature is therefore referred to as she. We will come to who is referred to as he in this context soon. We must interrogate the universal workings of nature herself, recognizing in her no merely specious and elusive activity of a distorting Maya. Here, very important recognition, nature is not a distorting, elusive activity. We have to go beyond these perceptions. Recognizing in her no merely specious and elusive activity of a distorting Maya, but the cosmic energy and working of God himself in his universal being. So here God is referred to as he, nature is referred to as she. And this is very common in spiritual tradition to bring this perspective of he and she, the unmanifest he and the manifest she, the form giver, the
the one who gives birth to multiplicity of forms and that which is formless, holding everything as he, formulating and inspired by a vast and infinite and yet minutely selective wisdom, Prajna Prasruta Purani of the Upanishad. Wisdom that went forth from the eternal since the beginning. Very interesting line here. A minutely selective wisdom. When we study the modern understanding of evolution, the scientific perspectives, we see reference to chance, the random mutations, even life emerging through random incidents, random encounters, creating the right conditions and out of that life emerging over billions of years and once life emerges then there is a struggle of various life form to survive and to evolve and grow and improve themselves. These are the perspectives given by the modern theories of evolution whereas here he is bringing in a minutely selective wisdom. So from the yogic point of view, nature, the universe is conscious. And this conscious universe has two poises, he and she. That which is nature as we are experiencing, as the manifest multiplicity, that is giving form. And there is God, who is the being behind, his universal being, formulating and inspired by a vast and infinite and yet minutely selective wisdom. Wisdom that went forth from the eternal since the beginning, from the eternal, timeless, eternal. From the beginning. Now that sounds like paradox. The beginning and the eternal. In fact, from the yogic point of view, there is no beginning or end. It's eternal. Without beginning, without end. That's one fundamental difference with modern views like, say, the Big Bang theory. Whereas in yogic science, there is no such beginning. There is a cyclic process. But there is no beginning, there is no end. It is eternal and timeless. For the general principle, we must interrogate the universal workings of nature herself, recognizing in her no merely specious and elusive activity of a distorting Maya, but the cosmic energy and working of God himself in his universal being formulating and inspired by a vast and infinite and yet minutely selective wisdom. Prajna Prasruta Purani of the Upanishad. Prajna is that wisdom. Prasruta is that is which is going forth. Purani, the very ancient wisdom that went forth from the eternal since the beginning. This whole notion of Maya, the nature as an illusion and working of a mechanical unconscious force, these two notions must be put aside. Here, Sri Aurobindo is bringing in a perspective where neither the perspective of Maya nor the mechanical force that is creating all this world of forms and nature are considered as the right perspective. All of them have their place, but there is a perspective that integrates all of this and yet transcends and gives much richer perspective. 
So we must interrogate the universal workings of nature herself, recognizing in her no merely specious and elusive activity of a distorting Maya, but the cosmic energy and working of God himself in his universal being. There is a universal being of God that is working through nature. Now, when we use the word God, let's not imagine the bearded old man up in the sky. We need to drop all such ideas. Let's just hold that word. Whatsoever Sri Aurobindo is meaning, we need to discover that word instead of responding with our conventional notions and reactions to specific words. So, there is nature, there is God. Now, what does Sri Aurobindo mean by these words? We need to dive deeper into it as we go further down into his elaborations. So, the cosmic energy, the cosmic energy and working of God himself in his universal being, formulating and inspired by a vast and infinitely yet minutely selective wisdom, minutely selective. It's not random chance that is leading things forward. There is a minute selection from our human mental perspective and its limited cognition, things might appear to be random. But from this other perspective, there is a minutely selective wisdom that is guiding the whole process of nature. So infinite and yet a minutely selective wisdom, wisdom that went forth from the eternal since the beginning. For the particular utilities, we must cast a penetrative eye on the different methods of yoga and distinguish among the mass of their details the governing idea which they serve and the radical force which gives birth and energy to their presence, to their process of effectuation. So for different methods of yoga, for every school of yoga, there is a governing idea behind a particular school. And at the same time, there is a radical force that comes from that particular idea. The governing idea which they serve and the radical force which gives birth and energy to their process of effectuation. For each school, there is a process of effectuation. Raja Yoga has its process of effectuation, utilizing the mind. Hatha Yoga has its process of effectuation, utilizing the body. The Jnana Yoga utilizes the power of intelligence. And its effectuation comes from that. Its radical force comes from that. And there is a governing idea. So we need to discern the governing idea and the force that is bringing the effectuation. So for the particular utilities, because each yoga has its own utility as I mentioned before, we must cast a penetrative eye on the different methods of yoga and distinguish among the mass of their details because each school of yoga has a mass of processes, kriyas, methods. We need to go beyond these details and look into the essential idea, the governing idea behind the hundreds of different processes they utilize. If we get lost in the details of a particular school of yoga, we miss the governing idea. It's only when we touch the governing idea, we can also discover the corresponding radical force which gives birth and energy to their process of effectuation. For every set of practice process that are developed, that have been developed over centuries, over millennia, 
there is a corresponding force and a corresponding idea behind it. So we need to go beyond the outer forms and rituals, ceremonies, kriyas, processes, and have a penetrating eye to see the underlying idea and the radical force that enables the transformation according to that particular method and brings its corresponding utility. Afterwards, we may more easily find the one common principle and the one common power. So this is the reason why we need to cast a penetrating eye into different branches of schools of yoga, cut through all the various processes, find the core idea and its force. Because then only we can find the common principle and the common power. These are two different things. One is the principle, that's other is the power, the radical force, from which all derive their being and tendency. All de derive their being and tendency. They come into being because of that particular idea and particular force. That particular tendency comes from the particular source, particular force they are sourcing. From which all derive their being and tendency towards which all subconsciously move and in which therefore it is possible for all consciously to unite. We can see that science is having this clear intuition that all forces of nature must eventually resolve into one single force. Now, same way, Sri Aurobindo is pointing out that all schools of yoga that utilizes different forces of nature and different principles of nature, actually they all come from a single fundamental common principle and a common force. It is recognition of that which will enable us to synthesize. And in fact, all the schools are subconsciously move towards this common principle, towards which all subconsciously move and in which therefore it is possible for all consciously to unite. So for uniting, for synthesizing all the schools of yoga, we need to look at each branch of yoga, identify their essential idea, an essential principle, and the force that is animating it, and then what is common to all these different principles and different forces, what is the common principle and common force from where they have derived their specialized utility. If we can see the common source, then all the various schools of yoga can unite and synthesize and find their deepest truth and harmony of coming together for a grand synthesis and more complex and rich evolutionary possibility that is unfolding. So that's the end of the first paragraph where he is giving us a hint of how the synthesis can be achieved by casting our eye deep into each school, finding its essential principle and force, and going beyond all the different principles and forces and finding that one common force and principle. There, the unity of all these diverse schools will be possible. Let's now move on to the Next paragraph, the progressive self-manifestation of nature in man. The progressive self-manifestation of nature in man. We have a complex sentence here. Nature in man, progressive self-manifestation of nature. Self-manifestation of nature. Nature is self-manifesting. And she is self-manifesting in man. Remember in the first chapter, 
Sri Aurobindo refers to man as her thinker. She created us as a means to accelerate her evolution. It is her, the progressive self-manifestation of nature in man, termed in modern language his evolution. Evolution is a modern vocabulary. Termed in modern language his evolution must necessarily depend upon three successive elements. So there is a progressive self-manifestation of nature in man and this must necessarily depend upon three successive elements. So the evolutionary process must depend upon three successive elements. What are these three successive elements? First, there is that which is already evolved. There is that which is already evolved. Then the second, there is that which still imperfect, still partly fluid, is persistently in the stage of conscious evolution. So first is what is already evolved and established. The second is that which is currently ongoing its evolutionary process. It is imperfect, it's partly fluid, but it is still persistently in a stage of conscious evolution. Now the third, and there is that which is to be evolved. So these are the three elements or three steps of nature. The title of the chapter is the three steps of nature. There is that which is already evolved. There is that which is, that which still imperfect, still partly fluid, is persistently in the stage of conscious evolution. And there is that which is to be evolved. It is still latent. It is yet to be brought out in that progressive self-manifestation of nature, the latent potentialities to be brought out. As he mentioned in the previous chapter, movement towards perfection is by bringing out the latent potentialities. So the third stage, this is that which is to be evolved and may perhaps be already displayed, if not constantly, then occasionally. So what is yet to be evolved, he says, may perhaps be already displayed. Prototyping might have been already done. If not constantly, then occasionally, at least occasionally, some prototypes must have shown up in nature's evolutionary process. Or with some regularity of recurrence in primary formations or in other more developed. And it may well be even in some, however rare, that are near to the highest possible realization of our present humanity. He is bringing in various nuances of the third step. So we have first step that is very well established. Second step is in the process of evolution. Third step is occasionally getting displayed or with some regularity of recurrence. This prototypes randomly showing up has some recurrence. It's not so random. In primary formations or in others, more developed. And it may well be even in some, however rare, that are near to the highest possible realization of our present humanity. So those rare specimens 
rare yogins who reached a level of perfection that is so beyond our comprehension. It may not have recurred multiple times. It may not be very common. It can be very, very rare. But nature has displayed some absolutely rare prototypes among the human beings. Some really stand out as those divinized examples, exemplars. They are not so common at all, very rare. In some individuals, this third step, divinization, has found more developed, even if it is rare in nature's past prototyping. So let me read this complex sentence once again. There is that which is already evolved. There is that which still imperfect, still partly fluid, is persistently in the stage of conscious evolution. And there is that which is to be evolved and may perhaps be already displayed. If not constantly, then occasionally or with some regularity of recurrence in primary formations or in others more developed. And it may well be even in some, however rare, that are near to the highest possible realization of our present humanity. So the present humanity has certain possibility and highest possibility. And some rare individuals historically have stood out who are really the early prototypes nature tried, demonstrated certain divine, divine possibilities. These are examples not necessarily mass-produced yet, or not at all mass-produced. Rare examples. Whereas many people have taken up the yogic exploration, realized many levels of inner realization, but even among them, some have reached the highest possibility. So there is a gradation of this evolutionary possibility within the present humanity. And some reach the highest heights, some are midway or on, they are much more frequent. Let me read that this line again. It's good to reinforce again and again. There is that which is already evolved. Three steps, that which is already evolved there is that which is still imperfect, still partly fluid, is persistently in the stage of conscious evolution, conscious evolution. And there is that which is to be evolved and maybe perhaps already displayed, if not constantly, then occasionally, or with some regularity of recurrence in primary formations or in others, more developed. And it may well be even in some however rare, that are near to the highest possible realization of our present humanity. For the march of nature is not drilled to a regular and mechanical forward stepping. Drilled into a regular and mechanical forward stepping. Nature is not a machine and from a yogic perspective, there is a reason why nature is called she, a conscious being and she is not drilled to regular mechanical forward stepping. It's not a linear progression. She has a movement that is quite different. 
she reaches constantly beyond herself even at the cost of subsequent deplorable retreats deplorable retreats she constantly she reaches constantly beyond herself here there is a current possibility within nature when i say nature it includes we the humans the possibility within human nature she pushes forward she reaches constantly beyond herself through us into a divine possibility even at the cost of subsequent deplorable retreats deplorable retreats regrettable painful difficult retreats it's like human effort when we see our own evolution and growth and our own creative works we reach out to do many things sometimes we reach out to do something that is way beyond our capacity we almost reach there but then things fall apart collapse and we fall back into the old and it can be painful and we can see collective social evolution reaching certain peak and falling back reaching another peak falling back she reaches constantly beyond herself even at the cost of subsequent deplorable retreats it's part of nature's process she retreats from the heights she reached she has rushes she has splendid and mighty outbursts she has immense realizations so the way she arbindo is looking at nature is like that vast infinite being at the same time one being she has rushes she has splendid and mighty outbursts like flowering of a civilization a mighty outburst she has immense realizations all these are part of her process and yet she can also go into subsequent deplorable retreats he hasn't revealed why such a deplorable retreats can happen he will come to it she reaches constantly beyond herself even at the cost of subsequent deplorable retreats she has rushes she has splendid and mighty outbursts like if you look at greek civilization there was a profound intellectual peak that reached in by civilization but in a small period of few centuries that flowering lasted and there was a decline in ancient indian civilizational cycles when we look at we can see certain peaks being reached and then decline that happened like last 400 years there was a decline in india a deplorable retreat into tamas she she reaches constantly beyond herself even at the cost of subsequent deplorable retreats she has rushes she has splendid and mighty outbursts she has immense realizations she storms sometimes passionately forward hoping to take the kingdom of heaven by violence really like a person she storms sometimes passionately forward just like and we can see in our own excitement when we discover certain possibility we get excited we get passionate and we rush into that to take heaven by violence remember the whole yoga is nature's own yoga her vast yoga of nature to unite with her divine reality she has that intuition in her that there is that divine reality with whom i can unite therefore she storms sometimes passionately forward hoping to take the kingdom of heaven by violence and that passion and that violence find its expression through we the humans and our civilizational cycles and pioneers of our leading edge 
leading edge people who lead our collective evolution, we can see certain passionate intensity in them. That divine violence with which they gather the strength and push the collectivity to go forward. Behind them is this nature's mighty force. It's not that friend end of the tiny little individual who is the source of that power. That power comes from the vast nature's impulsion. She storms sometimes passionately forward. So the revolutions in human societies happens led by individuals who opens to this mighty rush of her force, particularly the spiritual revolutions. Individuals surrendering to that force and she acts through them and they become the channels of her vast action and they become that mighty sword of action in the collectivity. She storms sometimes passionately forward, hoping to take the kingdom of heaven by violence. Her action can be intense. It is our human perspective that reads things as this is violence, this is non-violence. For her, it is that passionate intensity with which she is rushing forward. Even if thousands die on the process, she doesn't care. She is moving millions towards far forward, towards a greater destiny. There is a perspective that is very different from human Moral, ethical perspective is one thing, but this vaster yogic perspective that identifies with vaster movements of nature and sees the reality from that angle, that is the perspective Sri Aurobindo is bringing. It is only from that angle she can, he can write something like this. She rushes, she has splendid and mighty outbursts, she has immense realizations. She storms sometimes passionately forward hoping to take the kingdom of heaven by violence. It is when a yogi identifies with these vast movements of nature, he can feel the mighty rush of nature and look back into the history and understand how she rushed forward and then she retreated. Again, she rushes forward, she retreats. Sometimes with a mighty violence, she rushes. And she retreats. And there is a reason for her retreats. There is a reason, reason for her reaching out intensely and passionately. And that vision becomes possible when the yogic method allows you to identify with the vaster movements of nature. When the individual unifies with the cosmic nature, vaster nature, from that perspective, that's where he's able to write something like this. This is not poetry, this is literal description of how nature works, the conscious force in nature, how she works. And these self-exceedings are the revelation of that in her. And these self-exceedings, nature exceeds herself, exceeding what is established so that she can establish what is new. There is always an attempt to exceed our limits. And we can see that in sports. You set a record, then you want to break the record. That impulse comes from this nature's own vast impulse to exceed what is already established possibility. To push the limits, to cross the boundaries, to establish a higher level of possibility. And these self-exceedings are the revelation of that in her which is most divine or else most diabolical. But in either case, the most puissant to bring her rapidly forward towards her goal. So she can choose the divine or the diabolical the Asuric forces, the demonic forces, she uses all these forces and rushes forward in the world towards a higher possibility. And these self-exceedings are the revelations of that in her which is most divine or else most diabolical. But in either case, the most 
pure is sand. It gives the most direct, most powerful method to bring her rapidly forward towards her goal. Even when we look at the large scale violence that unfolds on earth, like Second World War, something like Hitler, what a violent manifestation that took place. And yet she utilized all that to free up nations that were colonized, free up people across the world by weakening the colonizing nations and also demonstrating what kind of asteric demonic forces lurk within human nature and to be aware of that at the same time she also bringing in the divine forces to deal with this evolutionary progression in humanity and these selfie exceedings are the revelation of that in her which is most divine or else most diabolical but in either case the most puissant to bring her rapidly forward towards her goal nature's goal goal of yoga is nature's own goal to evolve towards higher possibility, to bring out the latent possibilities in nature, moving towards greater and greater possibilities of perfection. And she rushes towards that. So three steps in nature, that which is already established, that which is ongoing, and that which is to be evolved, but demonstrated as prototype here and there, and some reached highest possibility. And nature sometimes is rushing forward, sometimes retreating. It is never a linear, mechanical, rigid march. Because nature is a living force. She is thriving. It's a dance of her evolutionary journey. With that, we come to the fourth episode. So looking forward to hear your feedback, your suggestions, and please don't forget to subscribe to this channel. And I will be releasing episodes every Wednesday, 6 a.m. So come back and looking forward to see you again. Thank you.